Welcome everyone. In today's video, we will explain why these 10 Dodges are so hard for most to remember. Let's get started. 1931 Dodge Coupe. Dodge built just 47,200 cars in 1932. Ford, by comparison, built 555,135. By that time, the Dodge brand had been absorbed by Chrysler Corporation and the nameplate was slotted between DeSoto and Chrysler in a multi-divisional step-up scheme similar to that of General Motors. In 1933, Chrysler would realign the Dodge brand between entry-level Plymouth and midline DeSoto. The 1931 Dodge was built in four versions, Series DD with 190 CI, 60 horsepower, inline 6 and 109-inch wheelbase, Series DH with 211 C1, 67 horsepower inline 6, and 114-inch wheelbase, Series DC with 221 CI, 75 horsepower inline 8, 114-inch wheelbase, and Series DG with 240 CI, 84 horsepower inline 8, 118-inch wheelbase. The year 1931 had a lot of firsts for Dodge, starting with its name. Prior to 1931, the brand was known as Dodge Brothers, not Dodge. The year 1931 was also the first time an overdrive transmission was used in a Dodge, and the first use of four-wheel hydraulic brakes, one year before Ford. The next car is the 1957 Dodge Custom Royal. Late 1950s car culture is full of love for the Tri-5 Chevy, the Corvette, the first Chrysler Hemi cars, and the Ford Thunderbird but Mopar fans are still waiting for the rest of the world to celebrate the impact of the 1957 Dodge Custom Royal. In 1957, Dodge went from being grandma's car to a new style that was longer, lower, and wider. Mopar expert and commentator Steve Magnante ran into this 1957 Dodge Custom Royal while covering the Texas Mopar Horde auction of the late John Haney's estate in 2021. This well-preserved, rust-free roller hammered for just $1,265. Steve reports that the 1957 Dodge featured a lower cowl height and was the first year of Chrysler's famous torsion bar front suspension. The model illustrates the beginning of Chrysler's Virgil Exner styling era, with its jet-aged visual cues, and was the first car to incorporate quad headlights, which technically weren't legal yet. Apparently, quad headlights were thought by most states to be too bright to be safe, so the inboard lamps on the 1957 Dodge played the one-year roll of turn signals. True quad headlights appeared on 1958 Dodges and have remained stylistically relevant ever since. 1959, Dodge Silver Challenger. Want a guaranteed bar bet win with a self-described car expert? Try asking him if he knows what year the first Dodge Challenger was built. The answer will inevitably be 1969 for the 1970 model, but he or she will be dead wrong. In 1959, Dodge introduced the Silver Challenger, which was a special trim level of the entry-level two-door sedan. The Silver Challenger was a decor group that was introduced in the spring of 1959. The Dodge press release photo shown here describes it all. A harmonious interior treatment features silver metallic vinyl and black Manchu fabric upholstery, carpeting, white wall tires, and wheel covers. It was designed as a quick and easy step up for customers who came in for the budget model. The $2,466 base price could be optioned with most powertrains, going all the way up to the dual quad 383 CI wedge but more often came with an aging L-head inline six that dated to the 1930s. The 1959 Dodge has a facade that has been described as a fright dream in steel. Can you imagine seeing that face in your rearview mirror? The 2018 Dodge Demon looks positively saint-like by comparison. We think the movie adaptation of the Stephen King novel Christine would have been far scarier with a 1959 Dodge than a 1958 Plymouth. What do you think? 1962, Dodge Dart. If the 1957 Dodge was one bookend to Virgil Exner's reign as Chrysler styling chief, 1962 was the other. Exner was known as a heavy smoker and was in the hospital a lot. He would eventually succumb to heart disease in 1973. As a result, he just wasn't around a lot to oversee things toward the end of his tenure at Chrysler, which ended in 1963. Styling at GM and Ford had already turned the corner by 1960, but Dodge was in freefall, with many critics calling the styling for 1962 a plucked chicken. Nevertheless, 
From an engineering standpoint, Chrysler was years ahead with its torsion bar suspension and new for 1962 B-body unibody platform, which would eventually underpin cars like the Dodge Charger and Super B. It was also the first year of the famed Max Wedge in 413 CI form, and if that's not enough, you could get the 1962 Dodge with the 727 Torque Flight 3-speed automatic, two years before GM offered the similar Turbo 403 speed Ford's three-speed C6 Trans wouldn't see the light of day until 1966. Seen in the picture is a 1962 Dodge police car, which was discovered and purchased by Steve Magnante. Making the car special are its unique 15-inch taxi wheels and heavy-duty cop car suspension, which would eventually grace some of Mother Mopar's most potent muscle car performers. Steve says the police car wheels can be identified by the hold-down tabs designed for hubcap-retaining fasteners, different from the normal hubcap nubs. 1965 Dodge Custom 880 Wagon An error in corporate intelligence caused Dodge to downsize its heretofore full-sized lineup starting with the 1962 model. The mid-size platform that it became would spawn most of Mother Mopar's intermediate muscle cars of the 1960s, but it left a huge hole in the full-size market from 1962 through 1964. Chrysler would eventually play catch-up for the 1965 model year, and among those catch-up cars were those from the Dodge 880 lineup. These were large family machines rather than muscle cars, but could still be ordered with much of the same muscle car equipment. Though popular, as they were as Chrysler's latest offerings, history and our collective memory would dismiss all but the most ostentatious sea bodies. This 1965 Dodge Custom 880 wagon, which came from the factory with a 383 CI wedge and a four-speed. Full-size C bodies are generally passed over as performance machines, but their cargo and personnel moving capability means they can't be overlooked as all-purpose fun transportation in the current era. 1972 Dodge Monaco Some cars are forgotten because they were flat-out ugly. But that clearly wasn't the case with the 1972 Dodge Monaco. Full-size luxury was a fickle segment to play in as a manufacturer. Though OEs would spend equal parts time and money developing every platform from small to large, smaller platforms could adapt upmarket or downmarket from year to year to account for economic trends. Larger ones that catered to more affluent customers tended toward boom or bust, depending on which way the financial wind blew. The 1972 and 1973 Dodge Monaco, with its sleek lines, hideaway headlights, and muscular attitude, had all the right ingredients to make a luxury muscle coupe, but its appearance at the onslaught of the high-performance apocalypse spelled doom. Many Dodge C bodies wore the Monaco name over the years, but it is the 1972 to 1973 Monaco that stands out for its style and substance. 1975 Dodge Charger Daytona when people start talking about the Dodge Daytona, they're inevitably chin-wagging about the storied 1969 model. Designed in the wind tunnel, loaded with a 425-horsepower Hemi, and let loose on the high-banked super speedways of NASCAR, the model is forever stamped on the American psyche. Dodge had a hit on its hands, so what to do? Name a bunch more cars the same thing and cash in, that's what. Over the years, there have been some hideous Dodge Chargers, the worst being the Volkswagen inline four-powered front-wheel drive L platform variant made from 1981 to 1987 forgotten, and rightfully so. Not so righteously forgotten is the last Charger Daytona to be built on the V8-powered rear-drive B-body platform from 1975 to 1978. Available engine options included a 185-horsepower, 400-cube-inch wedge and a 190-horsepower 360-ci small block. The 1975 Dodge Charger Daytona's only sin was in having the exact same shape and sheet metal as the Chrysler Cordoba. Far from being an ugly car, it was fine by us. The Cordoba was Chrysler Corporation's hero sales success, upstaging its lesser-optioned Dodge Charger Daytona twin. 1979 Dodge Aspen Designed as a replacement for the wildly popular A-Body Dodge Dart Compact, the Dodge Aspen was larger, roomier, and more comfortable. Motor Trend liked it so much it made Chrysler Corporation's new F-Body platform its car of the year for 1976. 
and likewise praised it for its modern design and good performance, but it quickly became the most widely recalled car in American history. On paper, at least, the Aspen looked good, with its new transverse torsion bar suspension. Effort was made to isolate the car's ride through bushings between the suspension K member and the unibody up front, with similar treatment lavished on the rear suspension and steering. Ride quality was noticeably better than the A body it replaced, giving it a more luxurious feel. Performance fans also appreciated the optional 135 horsepower, 318 CI or 195 horsepower 360 CI small block V8. A 100 horsepower 225 CI slant 6 was standard, mated to a three speed torque flight automatic transmission. Nevertheless, by 1977, nearly 1.3 million Dodge Aspens and Plymouth Volares had been recalled for safety and corrosion issues. As a result, few nice examples survive today. nineteen eighty Dodge Murata. The rear drive Dodge Murata and its Chrysler siblings the Cordoba and Imperial appeared at a time when the Chrysler Corporation was in deep financial trouble. Built between nineteen eighty and nineteen eighty three, the Dodge Murata was doomed from the start because little was spent on marketing due to Chrysler's chronic lack of revenue. That's a shame, because we think the Dodge Murata was one of the best looking cars from the era. The Murata's shape is largely the same as the freshened for 1980 Chrysler Cordoba, which meant most of its design carried over, from its formal roof line and uninterrupted body lines to its available V8 power, transverse torsion bar suspension, and sleek wedge-shaped nose. With only 28,633 Dodge Muratas built in 1980, this is one rare Mopar. As the final rear-drive V8-powered coupe until the Challenger's revival in 2008 on the LC platform, this would be the last mass-produced car to carry the Mopar hot-rodding banner for a quarter century. 1986 Dodge Omni Shelby GLHS By the late 1970, Detroit's automakers were hemorrhaging market share due to the influx of inexpensive front-drive imports. Of those manufacturers, Chrysler was in the worst shape, having to seek loan guarantees from the federal government for $1.5 billion. What they did with the borrowed cash was develop their existing L-platform car into the midsize K car. On the compact side, Chrysler used the L-platform to reverse-engineer the VW Rabbit, with the result being the 1978-1990 to Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon. In fact, with no four-cylinder engine production capacity, Chrysler even sourced VW built 1.7 liter inline four engines for the Plymouth and Dodge twins. The result was that Chrysler beat Ford and GM to the thrifty front drive four cylinder market and turned the company around, saving it from bankruptcy. Today, the Dodge Omni has faded from memory, which is not that big of a deal. Except in the case Carroll Shelby's GLHS of 1986, a hot rotted version of the Omni. It was limited to just 500 examples and featured an uprated 175 horsepower turbocharged, fuel injected, intercooled 2.2 liter turbo inline four that propelled the 2,540 pounds box to a zero to 60 time of 6.5 seconds, making it among the quickest muscle cars of its day.